Good afternoon. My name is Maya Tarashvili, and I'm a research fellow at FPRI, and I manage the Eurasia program. Uh, I am here to introduce our next speaker, um, Nick Gvazdev. Dr. Gvazdev is a uh, senior fellow with, with FPRI's Eurasia program. Um, he's also professor of national security affairs, holding the Captain Jerome E. Le Levy Chair in Economic Geography and National Security at the U.S. Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island. He was formerly the editor of the National Interest Magazine and a senior fellow at the Nixon Center in Washington, D.C. Uh, Dr. Gvazdev received his doctorate from St. Anthony's College, Oxford University, where he studied um, as a Rhodes Scholar. A frequent commentator on Russian and uh, Eurasian affairs, his work has appeared in such outlets as Foreign Affairs, The Financial Times, The Los Angeles Times, and Orbis. Uh, and he has appeared as commentator on CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, uh, National Public Radio, and BBC. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Nick Vostev. Thank you, Mark. Good afternoon, everyone. As Maya mentioned, my day job is with the U.S. Naval War College, and while I don't think the U.S. Navy has any official position on how the Russian Revolution ought to be taught, <laughs> uh, I will uh, issue my standard disclaimer that uh, my comments uh, this afternoon are my own personal opinions and do not reflect any official position of the U.S. Navy or the U.S. government. Uh, also happy. Uh, I have my uh, email up uh, if anyone uh, after this presentation would like more information, more material, feel free to contact me. I'll be happy to uh, connect you with anything that I have that may help you uh, in teaching uh, this period of Russian and Eurasian history. Uh, it was very useful to have uh, Stephen this morning set the overall frame and particularly his notion of Eurasia as an illiberal project. Uh, the lands lying between uh, Western civilization and sort of Chinese East Asian civilization and that this concept has an illiberal bent to it. Certainly uh, the events of the 20th century that we are commemorating the 100th anniversary of the revolution helped to contribute uh, to the illiberal strain that we see uh, in the lands particularly that made up the former Soviet Union. And then Michael's presentation very usefully brought us right up to the modern era. Uh, right up to the point of the collapse of the great empires. So I'm going to pick up the narrative from him uh, with looking at what will happen, what happened in 1917. Uh, it's important though as we go through this, and I think that you may have seen this uh, when you teach this period to students and others, is that uh, there can be a very deterministic view when we, one looks at the Russian Revolution of 1917, that it had to happen this way, that the rise of the Soviets was preordained, and more importantly, we often telescope uh, the events that happened during this period so that the person on the street often thinks that Vladimir Lenin is the one who overthrew the Tsar, right? That the revolution is just compacted down to basically one event. The fall of the monarchy and the rise of the Soviets are kind of brought together, and which loses out the fact that the Russian Revolution, and in fact, we're calling it the revolution. Uh, disguises the fact that there's a series of very disjointed events that happened between the fall of 1916 and the winter of 1917, 1918, followed by a three, three and a half year civil war uh, within the territories of the former Russian Empire uh, between multiple sides uh, that ultimately leads to the Soviet victory and the creation of the Soviet Union. And so it's important for us not to read back into the events of the time a sense that this was preordained. Of course, Soviet propaganda, Soviet historiography wanted to make it seem like it, this was the only way it could have turned out. And you know, Lenin arriving at the Finland station uh, when he returns from exile is that, well, there was no way it could have ended other than with a Soviet victory and with most of the territory of the old Russian Empire brought together under uh, Soviet control. We also tend to read the future back into the past. This is one of my favorite examples of Soviet photoshopping techniques because the Soviets pioneered uh, this uh, in a pre-internet age. Uh, so this is a uh, photograph of some of the demonstrations that are taking place in February of 1917. Uh, and then the Soviets went back and took blank banners and 
uh, commercial signs and then impose the slogans that they wanted people in February of 1917 to be espousing, even though that necessarily wasn't what they were espousing. They wanted to take their vision of what should have happened and make it so by, in this case, changing historical artifacts in order to produce this uh, tableau. And of course, the Soviets have a long history of uh, in changing inconvenient historical facts whenever possible, uh, you know, so that you look at some of the early revolutionary cohorts, a nicely packed photo, and then a later version is Lenin, potted plant, potted plant, <laughs> minor figure, potted plant, and uh, people are removed. Uh, but that is also a tendency now. We look back and we say, well, again, this is the only way things could have uh, unfolded because that's the narrative that we choose to, to, uh, to bring forward. Something that's also very interesting about reading the future back into the past is how the Russian government today is dealing with the 100th anniversary of these events of 1917. And the Russian government essentially is downplaying them because there are so many different versions of heroes and villains of the events of 1916, 1917, that if you try to put forward a narrative of, well, here were the good guys and here were the bad guys, uh, you create problems in modern Russian politics because Vladimir Putin has created, in essence, an unstable synthesis of imperial and Soviet uh, images and tendencies and is kind of trying to blend them together. Uh, and can use certain things, World War II as a unifying figure, uh, the Great War against Napoleon of 1812 as a unifying thing. 1917, though, is a very divisive point, not only in Russia, but also in other former Soviet republics, now independent states, because they have to grapple with the legacy of what this means. Uh, and whether you're in Ukraine or Belarus or Central Asia or Georgia or Armenia, uh, you will find that there are different readings of who are the heroes and villains of 1917 based upon the outcomes that you would have liked to have seen happen or that did actually occur. So what I propose to do is the title uh, that I created for this presentation is I want to go back and look at the events of 1917 as they unfold through the eyes of four people, four historical figures, uh, contemporaneous, uh, and looking at how they are assessing what is happening in the Russian Empire uh, on the eve of the revolutionary period and then as the revolution breaks out. So the first, uh, the first prophet is to uh, Grigory uh, Yefimovich Rasputin. We often refer to him in, as Rasputin. I won't keep going back and forth between Russian and English pronunciations. So since we know him in the West as Rasputin, I'll stick with that. Uh, Peasant mystic, advisor to the imperial family, played a very critical role in the politics of the late Russian Empire, uh, in some cases unintentionally, as we're going to see. Uh, but the first of the prophets uh, that I'm putting forward. Second prophet, of course, uh, Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov, better known under his revolutionary nom de guerre, uh, Lenin, Lenin, as we anglicize it. So our two prophets, the assassin, someone not as well known in the West, uh, Vladimir Purushkevich, a uh, reactionary Russian politician, one of the organizers of the so-called Black Hundreds, uh, usually described in, now as essentially Europe's first real fascist politician, uh, that he was the first to begin articulating many of the political ideas that would ultimately f uh, flower uh, in Europe uh, in the mid-20th century. He's a precursor of that. Uh, he was, uh, in essence, the, one of the main organizers of the plot to assassinate, successfully assassinate Rasputin, a member of the Duma. And then finally, the renegade, also someone usually not as well known in Western circles, uh, Sergei Maslovsky, who uh, uh, we know under his uh, revolutionary name that he adopted, Mstislavsky. Uh, a member of the Russian officer corps, came from a, a line of Russian officers, uh, but broke with his class and his caste to become one of the early leaders of the Social Revolutionary Party uh, in Russia. Uh, he's not one of these later officers who then joined the Bolsheviks. I think some people are familiar with that phenomenon of, uh, and uh, Stephen mentioned it this morning, of 
okay, the Bolsheviks have put the Russian Empire back together, so we were servants of the empire, now we'll become servants of the uh, Soviet state. Uh, he was someone who, in fact, was a true revolution, a true believer, uh, not a Bolshevik, not a Menshevik, not a Marxist uh, revolutionary, but part of the social revolutionary movement, the agrarian socialists uh, in Russia, uh, who uh, penned a very, unfortunately not very well known in the West, a very interesting memoir, uh, Five Days it's called. He picks five critical points in 1917 uh, and chronicles what happens as the revolution unfolds. So he's my fourth uh, person to observe through this, and I title him the renegade, and you'll see why uh, as the narrative uh, continues. Uh, so these are the people. This is my uh, uh, sort of scene setter for us. And now to proceed to our conversation. I want to start with the first of the prophecies and actually go with my second prophet with uh, Lenin. So Lenin, as January 1917 unfolds, uh, is in exile in Switzerland. He has been, uh, it's not safe for him to be, obviously, in the Russian Empire. Uh, but unlike previous periods of exile where Lenin had found refuge in London, he is now persona non grata in any of the allied countries because in 1914 he was agitating for an allied defeat in the First World War. Uh, he believed that an allied victory would be bad for the cause of revolution and therefore he wanted to see the allies defeated in that, re in that war in order to provoke uh, revolutionary uprisings in Russia and elsewhere in Europe. So he is not welcome in England or France or any of the other allied countries. He had spent time in exile in London before. Uh, he had a period of exile uh, where he spent time in the British Museum, like uh, Karl Marx before him, uh, doing research and writing. But after the war breaks out, uh, he will not be welcome in any, any allied country. And that's an important factlet to keep in mind as we see how events turn out. Uh, he is, by this point, a somewhat marginal figure in Russian politics because he's out of Russia. He's not on the ground. Uh, the Bolshevik party, ostensibly in Russia, is responsive to him, but he, it's difficult for him to communicate with them. Uh, they have adopted, as well as all of the other socialist parties in Russia, a kind of, we're at war, and while the war is on, we will, uh, we're not necessarily going to give our full-fledged support to the government, but we're not going to be involved in any active revolutionary uprisings against it. This was also based on an assessment that Imperial Germany was a bigger threat, that uh, as much as the Allies might be bourgeois capitalists, uh, the Kaiser was a worse threat, and therefore, for the sake of the future of Russia and of revolution in Russia, a German victory might not be something uh, advisable. So Lenin is, is in Switzerland. He's cut off. He's asked in January of 1917 by the Swiss comrades if he will give uh, an address to, on the 12th anniversary of Bloody Sunday, so the 1905 workers' protest in St. Petersburg, uh, which uh, security forces loyal to the Tsar had fired up upon and which helped to provoke the uh, unrest and uprisings across the empire that we know as the Revolution of 1905. So Lenin comes uh, to give an address to the Swiss comrades, and he lays out, on the one hand, he's, you know, he has his ultimate faith that ultimately the revolution will triumph. He says that you know, this war, as it continues, is going to lead to further unrest. It shows the corruption of the existing system. But if you read between the lines of that address, it's essentially an admission of failure. It said, yes, we had these revolutionary uprisings in 1905, 1906, but the Tsarist system still has life in it. It was able to recover. Uh, Michael noted in his talk uh, previous to lunch that you know, 19, after 1905, Russia gets its first constitution. There's a limited land reform, largely. Uh, the imperial family gives up millions of acres of land to be redistributed. Uh, across the Russian Empire. So there's a partial accommodation of the land hunger uh, of, the, of the peasant farmers. Not enough, as we're going to see, but at least a start to, to land reform. Uh, the Russian economy does recover after 1905. You have a period of about seven years of growth prior to the start of the war. Uh, and so Lenin says, yes, you know, the war is going on. It's terrible. You know, the workers will rise. And then he ends this address in Switzerland, where he says, but we of the older generation will not live to see the decisive battles of the upcoming revolution, the approaching revolution. We're not going to be around to see it. 
Uh, ironic, given that a little more than a year later, Lenin will be walking through the gates of the Kremlin to inspect buildings uh, in the Kremlin for use by the Soviet government, where the Soviet government will establish its uh, offices inside the Kremlin. So this is a case where Lenin, the prophet, is wrong. He looks forward and does not immediately see that there is a revolutionary situation uh, that will bring him and his party to power. There may be uprisings, there may be unrest, uh, but he sees this as a long-term process that will take many decades, and he doesn't assume that he necessarily will be around when the final revolution happens. About four weeks prior to Lenin giving this address, our friend uh, Rasputin uh, pens, supposedly pens what's known as his last will and testament. This is a contested document because the version that we have now can only be dated to the early 1920s in the uh, writings of Rasputin's secretary Simonovich. Um, and so some people say it's a spurious document. We do have contemporaneous letters that Rasputin is writing in 1916, though, indicating that he does think he's going to die, and he's going to die relatively soon, and that an apocalypse is about to break out over Russia. But I do want to stick to the last will and testament, because even if it turns out that it wasn't the actual document he wrote, it's so tied up with his legend uh, that it's too good of a story to, to leave behind. So Len, uh, Rasputin writes this last will and testament. He sends some communication to Tsar Nicholas and to Empress Alexandra as well, which has not survived, was not found among their papers uh, with the uh, belief that it was burned or destroyed uh, after it was received. But the document that Simonovich records is very interesting. Rasputin in it writes and he says, I don't think I'm going to survive to 1917. I will, I will leave life before the 1st of January 1917. By the way, just a note on dates, I'm, because Russia doesn't shift to the new calendar, until 1918, I'm still operating with the old calendar. So all my dates are the old. I'm not going to convert it to the dates in Europe. Uh, so uh, he says before, you know, so that would be January 14th, 1917 in, the, in uh, um, January 1st in Russia would be January 14th in, in the West. So he says by January 1st, meaning our perspective, January 14th, I'm not going to be alive. Then he says, well, I'm going to be murdered. And if I, he says, he's writing, to, in this testimony, he's writing to Nicholas. So he says to Nicholas, he says, if I'm killed by ordinary people, and especially if I'm killed by peasants, the assassins who kill me are of the peasantry, you have no worries. You will survive. Your son will sit upon your throne. Your dynasty will endure. If I'm killed by people of the noble class, the nobility are involved in the shedding of my blood, he says, they will not be able to wash my blood off their hands. And there will be a terrible civil war. Nobles will be, Russians will kill Russians. Uh, nobles will be exiled. There will be no nobles left in the land of Russia. And then he says to the Tsar, he says, if you hear the bell, which tells you that Gregory has been killed, and if a member of your family is complicit in my death, then I tell you this, within two years, you will lose both your throne and your life. So if I'm killed and any member of the imperial family has been involved in my death, it's the, uh, you, uh, the dynasty is over, you will die, your family will die, and the monarchy will be overthrown. Even if we think that Simonovich in the 20s is embellishing this, in this version, then he says, and then for 75 years, there will be the rule of Antichrist over Russia. Wow. So from 1917 through to 1992, the Antichrist will rule. So even if Simonovich is writing and is forging this in 1923, he at least got something right uh, for how long the Soviet Union will last. And as I said, there are other extant letters that Rasputin is writing during this time saying the apocalypse is about to break over Russia. So it's interesting to compare. Lenin from Switzerland looks and says the Tsarist system is under stress, but it's going to last for a while. Rasputin is saying we're on the verge of, of collapse. Of course, he is going to be murdered. He's murdered on the 30th of December. Uh, Putiskevich is one of his murderers, uh, but the other two that are critical for our story, Prince Felix uh, Yusupov, uh, 
who is uh, related to the imperial family, uh, is married uh, to a Romanov, and then Grand Duke Dmitri, who is uh, Nicholas II's nephew. So those elements of the prophecy uh, are connected, that in fact there are members of the imperial family that are implicit, uh, complicit in the death of, of Rasputin. So Rasputin is looking at what's happening and saying, we're on the verge of something disastrous happening to Russia. And coincidentally, Putiskevich, who is one of Rasputin's assassins, agrees with that assessment. So when we think about the start of the Russian Revolution, it's actually from the conservative side of the Russian political establishment that is, takes the first steps to head off what they see as the impending crisis. Because by 1916, Russia is in a, the Russian Empire is in a state of collapse. And when we, we throw these terms around today, we say, oh, well, you know, like Russia under sanctions has had a couple percentage points drop in GDP, and you know, Ukraine after uh, the uh, Maidan and seizure of Crimea and the Donbass has seen a 10% or so contraction. And we think of these as major changing events. Uh, by 1916, the Russian infrastructure is breaking down so that they can't get food and fuel reliably into the cities. It's not a question of a little bit of hardship today where, you know, in Moscow I can't get mozzarella from Italy and suddenly all the mozzarella in Moscow is from San Marino because it's not part of the EU and there's a in complicit deal between the Russians and the Italians that sanctions and counter sanctions none, not, not, notwithstanding that uh, you know you have products coming in from Europe that aren't EU members so San Marino or Andorra or uh, other places uh, it's not just a matter of some hardships I and mean, we're talking about collapse the Germans and the Turks have effectively blockaded Russia's Baltic and Black Sea ports so there's no imports coming in and Stephen talked this morning about you know, Russia's dependence historically on imports of technology from the West, machinery, goods and services, none of that is coming in. Uh, the rail system is breaking down. The casualties of the war up to this point, so more than a million Russian imperial soldiers have already been killed in the matter of World War I. Uh, so you have massive losses. You have the pressures that conscription is now beginning to bear. All of your patriotic, idealistic, officers uh, and enlisted uh, that were gung-ho in 1914 to fight the war are dead. And now you have people saying, where is this going? There's discontent there. On top of that, you have a government in Russia that is no longer the technocrats who saved the empire after the revolution of 1905. So when you look at what happens in Russian history after 1905, 1906, Nicholas very reluctantly, extremely reluctantly, turns to a series of technocratic, effective government ministers, Count Vite, Pyotr Stalipin, and others who say, we are gonna have to, we're gonna have to have reforms. We're gonna have to do things differently. Nicholas hates it. He sees it as an infringement on his autocratic powers. He tries to claw back some of that. And then we enter, Rasputin enters the picture. So Rasputin effectively gets introduced to the royal family after the revolution of 1905-1906, after the birth of the Tsar's son, uh, Alexis, who I think, as everyone knows, uh, because of the uh, genes passed on from Queen Victoria as a hemophiliac. Uh, at this point, we don't have treatments for hemophilia, so the risk of a hemophiliac is that you bleed to death if you get cut or something happens to you. Uh, Rasputin is introduced as part of the circle around the imperial court that is very interested in faith healing. He's presented as someone who can not necessarily cure hemophilia, but can uh, prevent the effects from uh, killing uh, the Tsarevich. Uh, becomes very close to, particularly then to Empress Alexandra. Uh, also feeds into this Nicholas's perception of, well, you know, the real Russia are the peasants, right? These bureaucrats and people in St. Petersburg who want reforms, they're not the real Russian. Again, Stephen talked about that this morning of you know, westernizing class at the top. And Rasputin really represents the purity of the peasant masses that love their uh, autocratic czar, uh, that see him as the little father. And so Rasputin gets introduced into this circle. What happens is that you have both in church and state people who look and say, 
Who is this guy? How come he has so much influence? And they're worried about that influence. So you have a reform movement in the Orthodox Church, which is going to be stillborn, in part because you have people in the church who question Rasputin's religious credentials. He's a faker. Uh, he's a charlatan. He's not really uh, a mystic. His powers, everyone admit, he had tremendous hypnotic uh, power, uh, tremendous influence, but you know, some in the church were saying that's demonic. It wasn't from uh, true religion. And then you have ministers saying, How, why does this guy have access to the imperial family? That's negative. We have to get rid of him. And what you see after 1912, because this is the year that uh, Tsarevich Alexis almost dies. He has an incident uh, at the uh, Imperial Hunting Lodge in Spala in Poland uh, and essentially almost dies. Uh, and Rasputin is the last person to come in. And, and uh, from that point onward, Alexander believes that the fate of her son rests in his hands, that he will not survive without Rasputin. So when people come and say he has to be banished, he has to be removed from the court, Rasputin says, well, this is a danger to me, obviously, if you have ministers and bishops and others saying, get rid of this guy. So he begins to react in political self-defense, which is if there's a minister who's trying to get rid of me, uh, I'll appeal to my imperial patrons and get the minister replaced. So by 1916, you have a, what people are referring to. You have the imperial government and then the procurator of the church and other officials. And they use this analogy of the people with the trembling hands. Right? These, these non-entities, because for Rasputin's purposes, non-entities aren't a threat to him. Non-entities are not going to come to him saying, you know, he needs to be banished from the imperial court. The trembling hands motif, of course, shows up again in the 1991 coup uh, against Gorbachev, but that is uh, uh, the uh, producers at, tel at uh, state TV that uh, don't, can't officially go against the coup for the 72 hours. One of the things they do is to focus in the press conference on the trembling hands of the, the coup leaders. So there's an image in Russian history of you know, ineffective leadership at the top. And so by 1916, people are saying we have this ineffective leadership. Nicholas has gone on a somewhat messianic role. He's he, by this point, has dismissed his cousin, the Grand Duke. A uh, very effective commander-in-chief has taken over personal command of the army. Alexandra effectively is running politics back in St. Petersburg as the regent. Of course, she's a German by birth, and so now you have people saying we have this German princess uh, as the empress, and is she really loyal to Russia? So people like Putiskevich are looking at, and they're saying, look, Russia's going down the tubes. Uh, the Russian government is going to collapse at the rate it's going. So the first strike actually comes from the conservative side. So Putiskevich and the Duma and others begin talking about we need a change. And this, of course, is a classic Russian political move, uh, the coup. Uh, plenty of times in, in Russian imperial history where you get rid of the Tsar. Um, Catherine does it uh, after the death of Peter the Great when they want to put uh, Peter II. Nope, we need her as an experienced hand, Empress Elizabeth, Catherine the Great herself, uh, Emperor Alexander, all came to power as a result of a coup. Now there's a sense that a coup against the Tsar himself in wartime may be very difficult to pull off. So the thinking is, if we eliminate Rasputin as a factor in Russian politics, and eliminate him, physically eliminate him, not banish him somewhere, but he's dead, one of two things will happen. Either this spell that he's exerted, Nicholas will wake up, right? It'll be, I'll wake up and I was under the spell of this peasant mystic and now I can think clearly and you'll see decisive leadership. Or Nicholas and Alexandra will be so overcome by the death of Rasputin that they'll step aside. They'll bring the Grand Duke Nicholas back or they'll, they'll step back from government and they'll allow competent ministers to return uh, to control. And so the decision, Putiskevich gets in touch with uh, Yusupov and others and says, we need to figure out a way to eliminate Rasputin. And this is seen as a prelude to some degree of a coup. There is some evidence also that the British and French ambassadors, looking at kind of Russia's performance in the war, are beginning to think this is not a reliable ally. We, we need a change. So Rasputin is killed. Won't go into great details. Again, part of his legend, the sense that he can't be killed. He's shot, doesn't seem to work, he's poisoned. 
doesn't seem to take effect. He's stabbed. He doesn't see, you know, he's wrapped up in a carpet. You know, again, the carpet uh, motive uh, wrapped up and he's shoved into the river and he supposedly has freed himself and is swimming and finally drowns because, you know, in the sense that he was, you know, un unstoppable. I mean, the fact that the cyanide they used was probably expired that the guys were drunk that were shooting at him and probably missed a number of times. But the, the legend, of course, was that he was, he was almost indestructible. Um, so he dies. His body is found several days later. They start the investigation. And of course, none of the expected things happen. So Nicholas uh, and Alexander both go into a very fatalistic, okay, he's dead. He said he was gonna die. The apocalypse is about to break. So you have that. There's also a sense, too, of Nicholas's growing impotence that this murder has occurred and he can dispatch Grand Duke Dimitri. He says, OK, you have to go to the Persian front. Ironically, that saves his life when the revolution happens because he's now outside of Russia. Yusupov is banished to one of his estates in central Russia where he begins to also gather up his goods and you know, particularly his movables so that when the second revolution breaks out, he's able to get out. Uh, Putiskevich is supposed to be sent somewhere, uh, but ultimately they don't get around to it. And you have the uh, phenomenon of a member of the Duma who's committed this famous murder walking free the streets of St. Petersburg. And that, again, sends a message of the growing impotence of the imperial government. If you can't detain murderers <laughs> uh, and you can't feed people and the system is breaking down, uh, there must really be a crisis. February of 1917, you start to hit the breaking point. And just like the, the start of the Arab Spring in Tunisia in December of 2010, uh, it's, it's something that you don't think of that sparks the revolution. It's, it's a protest. Women workers, because of course, just as happened in, in World War II, more men being conscripted to the front. You need to fill those jobs so more women are coming into the workforce. Uh, but there's no food, there's no fuel, so you start, you're starting to have protest marches. You know, we need to be fed, the prices are too high. And so you have one of these protests timed with International Women's Day as it occurs on the Western calendar, uh, occurs and the imperial government in St. Petersburg doesn't know exactly how to deal with this protest. So the usual response, of course, is send out the Cossacks, send out the guards. The problem is, is that by 1917, these aren't your well-trained, fanatically dedicated servants of the Tsar that they were three years ago. These are your second and third rate conscripts, many of them who don't want to be in the military, uh, have grievances themselves. And so you get the worst of all possible responses, which is a half-hearted attempt at repression. So some people are shot. There's some uh, struggles, but it's not enough to crush these protests, but it's enough to get people angry. And so you have essentially a leaderless revolution breaking out in February of 1917. And so bringing in our fourth figure, Mr. Slavsky, who is chronicling all of this. Mr. Slavsky is, again, social revolutionary. Uh, at this point, the socialist parties had agreed to a certain ceasefire with the government. Uh, there had been, after 1916, the creation of what were called industrial committees, which was how can we keep factories working for war production, uh, so owners and, and workers' representatives, and, and you had these movements there. And Mr. Slavsky says, you know, he has this great turn of phrase where he says, you know, the revolution caught us, the revolutionary leaders, asleep like the foolish maidens of the gospel story. In other words, these Disturbances start to break out, and we are completely unprepared for it. No, none of the revolutionary parties were agitating. There was no expectation. But what begins to happen is the imperial government in St. Petersburg starts to collapse. So our trembling hands friends don't know what to do. Military units start to desert. They start to either, in some cases, execute officers, or their officers come over with them and say, we share these grievances. They take control, and then of course, what happens is these disturbances in St. Petersburg, and you can chart how it spreads out. Uh, it spreads out over the rail and telegraph lines. So you start to have collapse of authority in St. Petersburg, and then the word begins to spread along the rail and telegraph lines, and then in other cities and towns and garrisons, people say, oh, this has happened in St. Petersburg. So 
you have more uprisings, spontaneous uprisings taking place. The um, conservatives, the monarchists, believe that actually they tr they're the first ones to try to use these disturbances for their benefit because they use them to go to Nicholas at the army command at Stavka in Pskov and say, you have to abdicate. Right? The country is breaking down. You have to give up power. You can't stay in power. There's no, you know, the soldiers are deserting. We don't have reliable military or security forces, so you have to abdicate. And this is one of these first of the what ifs, because the military officers who come to Nicholas with a proposal for his abdication are assuming that Nicholas will abdicate in favor of his underage son, Alexis. Alexis still has a degree of popularity. He you know, was seen as a unifying figure. The thinking is, is, well, we'll have this regency, but of course we will form an effective government, right? The, a 12-year-old is not going to be running Russia. Uh, so you'll need an effective government of military and of technocrats, and they'll take power in the name of the, of the heir. Nicholas says, no, I'm not going to give, because he realizes that if he abdicates, he and Alexandra will be separated from Alexis. Right? The, there's no way that having abdicated that they'll still be allowed to be parents to their, uh, to their son. So Nicholas says, no, I'm not going, I'll abdicate, but I'm not going to abdicate in favor of my son. I'm going to abdicate in favor of my younger brother, Michael. And some of the plotters in this say, well, that's, Michael just isn't going to resonate with people. There's no, he has, he's not charismatic, he's not a figure. Michael, he, but Nicholas says, nope, that's, I'll abdicate in favor of Michael. They proclaim Michael. Uh, has no impact then, because people say, well, Michael, why, why should we reign in favor of Michael? And Michael, to his credit, uh, when they come to him with the abdication of his brother, uh, says, I will not take the throne unless I'm offered it by a constituent assembly of the Russian people. I will, and kind of harkens back to the original Romanov dynasty in 1613, which was the throne was offered uh, to Michael, Mikhail Romanov, uh, by an assembly. And so the second Michael says, you know, I'm going to follow that precedent. So uh, the Tsar abdicates, now you don't have, and there's no successor. In St. Petersburg, uh, Mr. Slavsky notes this, and it's kind of like that uh, French revolutionary figure who said, you know, the people, I have to, the people are out running, I have to go find where they're going in order to lead them. Uh, and that's a similar thing that's happening in St. Petersburg. So uh, the liberals, uh, the liberal factions, the socialist factions are trying to figure out how can they get a government and how can they control what is going to be happening in Russia, in the empire. And here we run up against several other interesting Russian political features. And one of them is uh, the continuing divide in Russian politics between people who understand power and people who are intellectuals. Because for a lot of the socialists, in February of 1917, they're saying it's too early. We can't have a socialist revolution. Russia hasn't gone through a phase of late capitalist development bourgeois democracy. We can't take power. It's too early for us. It's too early for a socialist government. So we don't want power. Right? We, need the, we need the bourgeoisie to take power for a while, and then later on we'll, we'll, we'll transition to a true socialist government. So you have a reluctance there. And you have in the Duma, the elected parliament, leaders trying to organize a provisional government, except they have no real way to liaise with uh, the workers and, and particularly with the military units. So someone like Mr. Slavsky becomes very important because of his former military background of how can we connect with the various units, how can we connect with these factory representatives. And so the decision is, well, we're going to use the Duma to form a provisional government which will hold power until such time as a constituent assembly meets, but will also organize, going back to the 1905 revolution, will organize a Soviet, a council. So every factory in St. Petersburg and every military unit in St. Petersburg will send a representative to the Soviet, will ask for all throughout Russia, every community should organize their own Soviet. The St. Petersburg one will kind of act as the Soviet for all of the Soviets, and then from time to time we'll have a Congress of Soviets that will meet. Uh, and the provisional government says, fine, you know, Duma was meeting in the, one of the palaces known as the Tavrida Palace, and the Duma says, fine, we'll give you one of the wings of that palace for the Soviet. And so you have Mr. Slavsky with this great 
turn of phrase, he says, so you have the provisional government, he says, it's the Russia of the ruling classes which has lost power but doesn't know it. And then you have the Soviet, which is the Russia of the toiling classes which has power and doesn't know it, coexisting under the same. And you, you try then to forge some degree of a working government between these two, two groups. And the thinking is, is well, the, most of the socialist parties say, well, we will continue to support the provisional government as long as it begins reforms, constituent assembly, uh, and so on. All right, now we come back to Lenin. Lenin is sitting in Switzerland, and you know, three weeks after he says, I'm not going to live to see the decisive battles of the forthcoming revolution, the Tsar is out of power in Russia. Uh, and now it's, how do I get to Russia? Well, the problem is, is as a uh, enemy alien, or sorry, as a uh, undesirable alien, there's no way that he can get passage through France or Italy out of Switzerland. The Allied powers are not going to allow someone who is an avowed enemy of the Allies uh, to traverse their territory. Uh, no airplanes, of course, at this time, so only one way out, and that's through Germany. German general staff is looking at what's happening in Russia and German intelligence, which has been monitoring, infiltrating different Russian revolutionary movements. Uh, Ru German intelligence had established a link, by the way, to Rasputin as well, very interesting side story of German, uh, German intelligence's ability to try to penetrate and understand what's happening inside of, of Russia and using whatever they can to weaken uh, Russia as an opposing state in the war. Uh, the Germans make a fateful decision, not unlike the fateful decision I think that uh, you see in Israel in the 1980s when it came to Hamas and the PLO, which is, yeah, there's this extremist guy in Switzerland, yeah, well, let's, let's introduce him uh, into Russia because, you know, he'll do more damage there, but we don't think there's any long-term threat to Germany uh, by having this guy come back to Russia. So the German, uh, German emissaries contact Lenin and essentially offer him uh, safe passage. They'll give him with the famous sealed train uh, that he can traverse German territory and be delivered to neutral Sweden. And then from Sweden, he can slip across the border into Finland and from Finland to, to return to uh, Russia proper. And so that occurs. Uh, and Lenin arrives. Uh, and Lenin, initially, there's this as we see from some of the paintings, those are authentic. He comes back. He's greeted as a uh, you know, prophet, as a, a revolutionary leader. But then you have people saying, well, you know, the Germans helped you. Are you in the pay of the Germans and the like? Uh, and he also comes back, and he's shaking up. He says, you know, this is, this is a really bad idea, that socialist parties are cooperating with the provisional government. And this is an important factor, is that Lenin, while he's a theoretician, and a student of Marx is not ideologically as bound to Marx the way others are. And he says, we don't need to wait for Russia to go through a developed phase of capitalism. If we can take power now, we should take power. Uh, and so he comes in and begins to swing the local, because at this point, the Bolsheviks are cooperating with the provisional government. He starts moving through and making the case, no, we should move into open uh, revolution against the provisional government. Uh, forget this. Uh, sharing of power, this dual power arrangement we have, uh, the Soviet should seize power uh, on its own. The provisional government, of course, is working through its, you know, it's got many different factions, uh, liberal factions, democratic factions, different socialist factions, and the like, and it's trying to, on the one hand, establish order. It makes the fateful decision of continuing to prosecute the war which some people now feel was a, a major mistake, that if they had kind of said, we're out of the war, just do an armistice with the Germans uh, so that we have time to, to consolidate. The other problem is that the Duma had an inordinate amount of lawyers, because Russia had a very well-developed legal system and tradition of law. And these lawyers, and particularly uh, a, a lot of Russian lawyers, had been influenced by the writings of Goronovsky, who was a uh, 19th century conservative liberal. So they're very big about proper procedure. And so they're saying things like, you know, the peasants are saying, we'd like to be able to take land now, right? Uh, we, we want land. And people are saying, we want to see things transferred. And the Duma says, we have to wait. We can't do anything until there's a constituent assembly, and we have to draw up a constitution, and we have to draw up the proper laws, 
Uh, so just keep waiting, and we're not, we're not prepared to hold elections yet, and they keep putting off the date of the, when the elections are going to be held. And then they say nothing can happen until the elections, and then the Constituent Assembly will meet, and then everything will be resolved. So there's a lot of pent-up uh, frustration with the provisional government. As long as most of the socialist parties are still supporting the provisional government, and uh, by the summer, uh, we have the ascendancy of the socialists in the provisional government led by uh, Alexander uh, Kerensky, uh, the, who was the Minister of Justice in the first provisional government and becomes the Prime Minister in the second provisional government. Uh, of We're going to you know, hold the line, prepare the ground for the Constituent Assembly. Lenin uh, comes out and says, forget, the con forget waiting for this, peasants should have land now, peace now, power to the Soviet now, and again, Lenin's ability to recognize that people weren't going to wait for long, complicated treatises and legal procedures, that there were pent-up demands, and his vision was, well, let's just appeal to those demands, get people swung over. Uh, in uh, July of 1917, uh, Lenin decides to see whether or not you can test the strength of the provisional government. And so the communists, the Bolsheviks, uh, make their first attempt to try to take power. Uh, it is beaten back. It is beaten back by uh, what remains of the army. Uh, but also the other socialist parties uh, turn against Lenin on this. He has to flee into uh, hiding in, Swi in um, Finland. But it also reveals a great deal of division within the provisional government. There's now different forces pulling at people, and particularly among the socialists, because, and Michael mentioned this with regard to the Armenians, is you have a number of the socialist leaders are now being torn between, do you want reform for the Russian Empire and to move the Russian Empire towards a more liberal republic, or is it time for the Russian Empire to start segmenting into its constituent parts? So Baltic, Polish, Ukrainian, Georgian, Armenian leaders in St. Petersburg, socialist leaders, are now feeling the push and pull between the all-Russia empire, we want to reform and kind of keep the empire together, or is it time for our parts of the empire to break off and be their own sense? And there is also this sense, too, of who are these leaders? And so Mr. Slavsky, in his memoirs, records he was actually the, um, de the leader of the delegation that went to secure Nicholas, the deposed Nicholas and Alexander when they were arrested and held under palace arrest at the Alexander Palace. Uh, and this is one reason why I term him the renegade. He goes and the uh, Count Beckendorf, who is the former chief of the imperial court, knows him, knows his family. And when he comes to arrest the Tsar and Empress, and he describes this in his memoirs. You know, he's in the leather jacket and you know, kind of revolutionary attire. And Beckendorf says, you know, if only if your father could only see you, what a disgrace. And then he says, why are you with these people? Why are you with these Steins and Idzes and Ishvilis? Why are you with them? They're not, you know, and it's, it's an early appeal to, you know, they're not Russians, ethnic Russians. Why are you with them? Mr. Slavsky says, you know, this is the revolution, we're going to move forward, we're going to make a new Russia, but you're starting to see those tensions build up as well, which is Russian Empire, imperial identity, Eurasian identity, or is it time for different pieces of this empire to break apart and for people to, uh, to do that? All right, so you have uh, Lenin, first attempt fails. Then in August, the conservatives, Putiskevich, you now get this wing of the right, so the former monarchists, very few partisans by, the, by this time of Nicholas, right? Almost no one wants him back. They all blame him for what has happened. So even people that were monarchists uh, were not agitating for his restoration. So monarchists, conservative liberals, and uh, a faction within the army says this, this disorder can't continue. And so they persuade, well, I shouldn't say persuade, they, uh, they find an adherent in the commander-in-chief of the, of the Russian army, um, General Kornilov, Lavr Kornilov, uh, 
that essentially, in order to save the Russian state, there has to be a military coup. You have to basically stop fighting the Germans for a while, turn units around, march on Petrograd, because of course, St. Petersburg was a German name, you're fighting Germany, so Petrograd, nice and Slavic. March on Petrograd, disperse the provisional government, set up a military dictatorship, uh, and stabilize the situation. So Kornilov, um, and Kornilov is not a monarchist. Kornilov was, uh, had uh, detained Alexandra right after the February Revolution happened. He was in charge of the military detachment that secured, um, secured the, uh, the Empress. So he was not someone who was a, uh, a bleeding, uh, bleeding heart monarchist. In fact, you, you had this group within the Russian army of uh, a group of officers who had risen on the basis of merit, uh, who were law and order, but not necessarily died in the world monarchists. They would be happy just to have a strong state. That was their big lodestone. And so Kornilov begins the move to disperse the provisional government. Soviet historians always assert that Kerensky was in on this, that he was, the, he was instigating this in order to uh, disperse the uh, Bolsheviks. So if that was his plan, then what he actually did was counterproductive because he releases the Bolshevik leaders from jail. Uh, he allows them to rearm the Red Guards. He says, I need you to help me fend off this coup uh, against, uh, that's coming against me. They get the railway workers to cut the rail lines so that uh, Kornilov's forces can't get to uh, Petrograd, so the Kornilov coup uh, fades. Um, Putuskevich, who plays a role in this uh, man with a bunch of lives, still never jailed for anything. He's not been jailed for Rasputin's murder. He's not been jailed for his instigation, potential instigation of a coup against the provisional government. Um, but there's the sense now that Kerensky, well, we thought he might be someone, um, and this is, you get this from the army in particular, maybe this guy was going to be someone who was going to be a law and order person, but he's not. He's just a, another socialist agitator like the rest. Uh, and so um, Kerensky begins to lose his base of support. Lenin comes back from Finland. The Red Guards are now armed. Kerensky says, OK, the crisis is over. Turn your weapons back in. And the Red Guards, <laughs> nope, we're not, we're not surrendering our weapons. We're going to maintain our separate military units. Um, Provisional government is breaking down. The non-socialist uh, parties are leaving. There's a great deal of discontent on what we might see as the conservative side of the spectrum, that you know, this is becoming a lawless country. Lenin still has opposition. There are still members of Lenin's own inner circle that don't believe. And of course, this is something that will be used against them in Stalin's purges in the 30s, Zinoviev, Kamenev, and others, that they were insufficiently revolutionary. Uh, Lenin in September and early October saying, this is now the time. We need to push for power. Uh, disperse the provisional government. Uh, and he again comes up with one of his critical phrases, history does not forgive revolutionaries who procrastinate. If we can seize power, let's do it. So at the end of October prior, they're going to be convening the Congress of Soviets. So all of the Soviets of Russia will be sending delegates to St. Petersburg or to Petrograd. And Lenin's view is, let's present the Congress with a fait accompli. When the delegates arrive, we will say the provisional government has been dispersed, and we will now create a Soviet government. Uh, they begin the uprising in uh, Petrograd. Surprise, surprise, Kerensky's on the phone. Military, I need help. And military is like, well, what's left of it is you didn't want our help in August when we were prepared to disperse these movements, uh, we're not going to help you now, other than the famed women's battalion, the women's death battalion, in the, as it was known, uh, in the Winter Palace is pretty much the only unit that continues to defend the provisional government. And again, we have the trembling hands phenomenon at the end of ministers uh, doodling on pads until, again, the palace was not stormed. That's later Bolshevik. Uh, movie making, we have this image of people running across. It was essentially people walked in. Um, the women's death battalion said, are you coming? You know, all right, we're, we're not going to fight. We're going to just disperse. And they arrest the ministers of the provisional government. Finally, Putuskevich ends up in jail <laughs> uh, for his, uh, you know, but he will be released uh, because he has friends among the Bolsheviks who admire him for having killed Rasputin. So Bolsheviks take power in St. Petersburg. 
Uh, and then what begins to happen is this three, four, five-way struggle uh, over the next couple of years. Um, other socialists, some are brought into the Soviet government. The left social revolutionaries form a coalition that helps to disperse th that it's not just the Bolsheviks taking power. So they find these useful allies and some of the other socialist movements that help them. Uh, some movements, other socialist movements, uh, decide that they will fight uh, the remnants of the monarchists. Uh, and then, of course, the national movements. So you have, by the end of 1917, the takeover of power by the Bolsheviks in St. Petersburg is the mechanism by which now other parts of the Russian Empire declare independence. Ukraine, Georgia, uh, Finland, Poland, once the uh, provisional government is dispersed. They say there's been a legal takeover of power in St. Petersburg. We now declare formal independence uh, and try to create their own states. Uh, and then, of course, in these parts of the Russian Empire, you end up with three, four-way conflicts between local socialists, conservatives, particularly in Ukraine, anarchists, and then pro-Soviet Bolshevik forces uh, competing for power. Uh, the Bolsheviks, uh, testimony to Lenin, you like him, don't like him, you have to give him credit for being an organizer uh, and understanding the uses of power and understanding the uses of terror, uh, organizing an elite force, crushing opposition, uh, and being able to reconstruct the old empire as much as he could, bit by bit, putting it back together uh, so that by 1921, pretty much all of the exception of uh, Poland and Finland uh, and some parts of Western Belarus and uh, Ukraine and Moldova are back under uh, the rule of a single entity, uh, but this time happening to be a red one, not a white one. And so you end up with uh, the Soviets in power. Let me just, uh, how are we doing on time? Let me just conclude because this has come up now, of the uses of history. So people today say, well, look at Russia today, 100 years, could you have another revolution? Uh, there's always black swans, something could happen. But when you compare what happened 100 years ago to what you happened today, you don't have the economic collapse. You have discontent. You have nothing near the economic collapse uh, that you had 100 years ago. Like it or don't like it, you do have competent people running the government today. These are not the non-entities, uh, Rasputin appointees who uh, don't know or are not willing to, to make decisive moves. Uh, and finally, one of the impacts of the revolution is, in particularly in Russia, and the way that the Russian media has covered revolutions in other parts of the former Soviet Union over the last 20 years, a lot of people are very skittish now of, I may not like what I have now, People didn't like what they had in 1917 either. Look what they got. They got things a lot worse. And that's a very powerful force in contemporary Russian politics of people saying, I may not like things today. I certainly didn't like what happened after the fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, and so maybe I shouldn't risk, we shouldn't risk what we have to pursue a revolutionary change that may end up a lot worse. And I think that's ultimately the real lesson of the 100th anniversary that the Russian government, current Russian government, has been sending out, which is you know, revolutionary uh, feeling may be fine. Look at what revolutions bring you and what you get from them, which is usually not something good. So stick with the status quo rather than, than take the change. All right, so I think we've got some time Thank for some questions. You. Thank you very much. Uh, Paul Bow from uh, Norfolk High School in Silver Spring, Maryland. I was wondering if you could sort of elaborate on the process that the Bolsheviks used to spread power out from uh, Petrograd after they had seized power from there. One of the things that the uh, Bolsheviks were very good at, and this again is Lenin's tactical genius, understanding the importance of the vanguard party, understanding the importance of a tightly connected disciplined party elite. So when the Bolsheviks took power in Petrograd, and having seen how the first revolution in February had spread, of course, one of the first things they did was take control of the telegraph exchange so that they could control information coming in and out. And then the second thing was the tactical alliance with the railway workers' unions to make sure that they could move on the railways and that their opponents could not, that they could then say, block. You know, if there's 
troops coming in block them from, from doing that. Uh, so after the seizure in Petrograd, the word went out to cadres, do the same thing in other cities. Moscow uh, was, in fact, uh, not a bloodless takeover. It was several weeks of um, communist Bolshevik forces attempting to take power, uh, the army fighting back. Uh, the Kremlin was damaged. Uh, the Kremlin was shelled by um, pro-Soviet forces to try to dislodge uh, the, the uh, forces still loyal to the Constituent Assembly. Um, in some parts of Russia, what happened was the Bolsheviks essentially came in and said, look, we're, Soviet government will take over. Uh, you, particularly other socialists, don't worry, we'll broaden it out. You know, we're, it's not just going to be us. We're going to bring you in, uh, so don't oppose it. Uh, and then in some places, what the Soviets, the Bolsheviks were very good at is, is saying, you know, this is a, a Hobson's choice for you. Um, go with us or run the risk of reaction. And particularly for the peasants, you know, until Stalin's collectivization, the Bolshevik message was always, take the land, we'll ratify it. And, you know, until Stalin said, you know, I'm going to take the land away from you, by which point. Uh, so that, that spread out. It ran into problems, obviously, in uh, one of the first areas it ran into serious problems was, was in Ukraine. Uh, because what happened after the fall of the um, provisional government in Ukraine was first the Ukrainian socialists took power uh, as a Ukrainian state. And then the Germans installed a, uh, uh, led a conservative reaction with Hetman uh, Skoropadsky. So that was an attempt to try to blunt the, uh, the takeover. Uh, the Baltic states by this point kind of uh, were um, in play. Finland was also moving out. And then the real battles then for the Bolsheviks beyond that was they were able to take power in Moscow. Southern Russia, they did not, and then in Siberia. Uh, and there, what they did was to essentially rely on the fact that the anti-communist movements could never coalesce into a single unified entity. So they played movements off against each other. So that they could say, well, you know, this is, everyone is anti-Soviet, but you know, that group wants the czar back, and this group wants socialism, and this group is bourgeois democratic. And so they were very good at uh, playing that off. And also, again, making t Lenin had no problem making tactical deals. So the creation of the Far Eastern Republic as kind of a non-Soviet uh, Russian entity in the Far East, um, which allowed for elements of the old constituent assembly and of the provisional government to regroup for a while. You know, the Soviets uh, were prepared and they let it survive for a couple of years. So as long as it was, you know, don't bother us, what we're doing here, we'll let you run your own affairs in the maritime provinces to the east. So a lot of divide and rule, but also the Bolsheviks were just more, they had a disciplined cadre, they built up a party organization, uh, and they did that. Finally, the appeal to Russian nationalism, um, that uh, particularly to the uh, army officers, right? You don't like us for our socialism and our atheism, but you like a powerful state. Uh, and also cultivating this idea that you had in the 20s, right, of uh, what was known as the radish, Right? We may be red on the outside, but slice us and we'll be white on the inside. So uh, the appeal to uh, enough members of the old imperial military that uh, the best bet for you moving forward was to um, line up with the, uh, with the Soviets. So all of those were factors. You used the word just now, illiberal, and at the beginning of your talk, and I'm a little bothered by the word uh, because it seems to be assigned as if it's a political dogma or a political teaching. Um, and you suggest that the Bolsheviks had an illiberal view, which, fair enough. But isn't Lenin's organization really um, fitting in with an illiberal political culture, um, which makes me much less inclined to use it as a negative mm -hmm. term? That is, if you have in Eurasia people who are inclined to a certain kind of regime, um, then attributing illiberalism to an ideology or to a person doesn't seem to be really understanding the problem correctly. And I use it primarily just as a descriptor, right? That these are movements. And so when you look even at the anti Soviet movements, 
And some people argue what you now have in Russia today is 100 years later the whites have won because much of what characterizes the ideology of the Putin regime is what most of the white thinkers were thinking, right? Which is you're not looking at Western individualism, you're looking at the primacy of a collective, you're looking at the primacy of traditional values and the like, and you're looking at a leadership structure which is responsive to the popular will but doesn't work on the mechanisms of competitive elections to, to determine what that popular will is. So for the Soviets, obviously, it was we rule on behalf of the working class. That was Lenin's, one of his ideas was that we don't, you know, we understand what the proletariat needs and so we, will rule, we, are, we are democratic because we are ruling on behalf. For the whites, it was this idea, and that particularly Pudiskevich is interesting, I mean, he's an extreme, but this, you know, the idea of kind of the nation that there is, you know, ruling for the benefit of the people but that doesn't mean that you check in with the people and you have to have a bunch of rules and how that is done. Um, so you did have genuine Democrats in the, in the Duma and in, the, in some of these movements in the, um, in, in the white movements, but they generally were subsumed after a while. Uh, and then the feeling that, again, the failure, because Kerensky, I think, would be someone you would say is a genuine Democrat. When you look at his writings, you look at what he, he abolished the death penalty as Minister of Justice, said that no one in Russia should be put to death for any crime, uh, wanted elections, wanted all of that, and then people said, yeah, partly they argued, yeah, he was uh, someone who didn't understand the environment he was in, that if he had either just been a stronger figure and ruled with that iron fist, he could have prevented, if he'd let Kornilov do the coup, then, you know, Russia would have avoided the Bolsheviks altogether, but because he was, you know, a liberal, small l, he, he failed, and that's why he ends up at Hoover Institution at Stanford rather than as, you know, <laughs> statesman in Russia. So that is part of that. But yeah, you do see that, that among, the, and that's also why in the 20s you had this reconciliation, going back to how the Bolsheviks consolidated, you had this reconciliation of reaching out. Putiskevich, not one, but some of the other people who had been active in the Black Hundreds move into the, into the Communist Party. You know, they were reactionaries in the 1905 and suddenly in the 20s, and it's this idea of, you know, proletariat, Russian nation, all kind of the same thing, and, you know, this is just Russia under another name. Um, again, Stalin kind of, you know, upends a lot of that, but at least in the 20s, that also helps the Soviet regime consolidate itself. So, did you have a... time for one more question. Yeah, did you have a... Okay. Thank you. Hi, I'm Christina Cohn from yeah. Smithtown High School in Long Island. And um, I guess I'm just listening to you and it, you know, I'm, I'm fascinated, great storytelling. And I, I'm wondering about the role of Rasputin because the way that you've just portrayed it, if I've understood it correctly, contradicts how I teach it in the classroom. So now I'm going, oh no. Um, you know, so when I, when I illustrate the causes of, of the Russian Revolution, you know, we talk about the political, social, and economic discontent. We have an autocrat, we have two thirds of the population who are suffering, uh, the failures of the Great War and all this. And I do tell the story of Rasputin because it's too good not yeah. to, but I say, but that's kind of insignificant. Like if we remove that from the e equation, you know, would much have really changed, right? And so I, I'm just a little bit surprised to hear, uh, it, again, if I'm understanding this correctly, you, you attributing him yeah. to, to having such a large part in this, so I don't know. I, I think we have to acknowledge his role, not that he had a political vision himself necessarily, but his role in blocking people from being in government. Um, he was an avowed opponent of Stolypin, even though as a peasant you would think he'd support the land reform, and in fact one of the things that catapulted him further in the eyes of Alexander was he predicted Stolypin's death. He said, death is following this man uh, right before he gets assassinated in Kiev. Uh, and so the sense that Rasputin is kind of, you know, it's like the, the, the dog and the ox fable, right? The dog doesn't eat the hay, but he prevents the, the cattle from coming in. I, I would portray Rasputin in that way, right? That he is not himself organizing Russian politics in a way because he has a vision, but because of his immediate need to make sure I don't have a prime minister who's telling the czar to get rid of me. I want to see non-entities in these positions. And I'm reinforcing Nicholas's existing, and Ale particularly even Alexandra's, existing predispositions to say reformers are bad, 
They're trying to take away my holy autocratic powers and reinforce it. Because Alexander in particular kept always saying, well, but Rasputin is the real Russia, right? These guys in St. Petersburg, they're not, Ru they're not the real Russia. They're just bureaucrats and, and others. You know, he is the Russian masses. And if he doesn't want these reforms, he kind of, so that it's not in the sense that I would agree if, if you, you don't want to make me say that Rasputin is maneuvering Russian politics because he is doing it as a political actor. He's doing things, though, as a intimate of the in imperial court, which then have these political impacts, uh, and particularly in blocking or because Alexandra, one of the things with Rasputin that's important, Alexandra was starting to send candidates to him. So someone would say, you should appoint this person as minister of food. And they'd say, well, you have to go see Rasputin. And he would have meetings. And then he would say things to, well, you know, I don't sense that he's a good man. Uh, God is not with him. Uh, and so she would be, OK, this guy's off the list. And that's partly why assassinating him was such an important thing, uh, particularly for the conservative members of the Duma, which was this guy had a, not, again, not because he's playing a political role, because he wants his own people or things, but because he is seen as someone who is reinforcing Nicholas and Alexandra's tendencies to pick the wrong people and not to listen to advice. So he, I would then say you have to treat him as a political factor, um, that if he was not there, uh, and again, it goes back to personalities, because people knew, I mean, Nicholas was, uh, Nicholas could be dominated by the people around him. And when he was younger, he was dominated by his father's advisors, so people like Count Vita, who were you know, in the architects of Russia's industrialization, and kind of when he broke out of that and then had these other people around him and then closed off other advisors. Yeah, so certainly that's why you had that plot to remove him, uh, because this sense that he is a, a negative force. Thank you. Join me in thanking Nick Kovacic. Yeah.